I want to share something with us today. We're going to begin a little bit of a journey through the month of June, looking at something that is easy to lose sight of in the world in which we live, uh, full of things that distract us and take our attentions away from the eternal, full of wars and challenges in the world around us that uh, seem to envelop and captivate us. And so today we're going to refocus on the thing that is actually extremely important that we hold on to as our hope. And so we're going to start this journey, carry it through the month of June, and we're going to be talking about heaven. And given the uh, memorial service that we're having this afternoon, the, the timing of this seemed to coincide quite well. So I hope that you'll be able to stay by in June as we look at some of the things that give us such hope about this joy that awaits us. With that, let's pray and seek God's blessing as we open his word. Father, we have gathered in this space today to meet with you as a community. We're asking that you would speak and that we might receive and that you might rekindle within us our imaginations and our longings for heaven and to be in your presence. And we ask this in the name of the one who makes it all possible, our Savior Jesus. Amen. So as a kid growing up, there was something I loved to do on Sunday mornings. Uh, there was this program on the TV, and these were the days when you actually had to schedule what you wanted to watch because it only came on at certain times. You had to actually show up in front of the TV at a certain period of time because it was not going to be played any other time. So you had to build your life around somebody else's schedule. Um, and for me, Sunday mornings were a time when my brother and I would get out these big Tupperware bowls and we would fill them up with cereal and we would watch Looney Tunes cartoons. Now, some of you know what I'm talking about. Uh, Bugs Bunny is one of those characters. Uh, uh, Elmer Fudd was one of those characters. Yosemite Sam but probably one of the favorites was, was the Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote. And Wile E. Coyote was one of those really interesting characters that always had the same reincarnation every time. I didn't understand reincarnation at the time or that it was a thought in, in uh, people's consciousness in other places in the world. But Wile E. Coyote, he always had bad things happen because he was doing bad things. He had bad things happen to him that pretty much brought an end to his life, and he always came back the exact same person. There was never an advancement for him. Uh, it was a really, really uh, tough job, I think, to be Wile E. Coyote, trying to catch the roadrunner. But anyway, so we would watch these cartoons on Sunday mornings, and you're probably wondering, what, is, what, what does this have to do with church? Stay, stay with me. Once in a while, the cartoons would give this depiction of someone that had died and gone to heaven. And, and so you get this idea in your head as a kid that when you die, you go to heaven. But the heaven that was depicted in the cartoon was kind of a little bit like this. You would be floating around on a cloud playing a harp. And I remember thinking as a kid, that really does not look like much fun. I'm not so sure that that's something that I'm super interested in because it seems a whole lot less interesting than what's going on here and now. Any of you ever experienced that growing up? Maybe I'm the only, okay, a couple of us did. And so the idea happens that this kind of becomes a thought. This becomes a little bit of a perspective that you can develop. 
And along the way, I remember hearing this thing in church because I started going to church as a really, really little guy. And I remember hearing this idea of eternity and trying to wrap my head around what that meant, that this is what heaven would be. It would be a, an eternity of existence and everything that I knew in my short years and in my very limited lifespan was that things had a beginning and once in a while things had an end. And the end was often not so good. So eternity was something I just could not get my head around. So I, I heard these things in church and I was trying to figure out what is heaven ultimately going to be like? What does it even mean? And along the way, the idea kind of came, and maybe some of you didn't deal with this growing up, maybe some of you did, heaven became something that was kind of this other than. It was so far out of my ability to comprehend that it was just kind of set off to the side. Heaven is that thing that is out there, it's other than, it's not able to be really understood. And so what that often will do is it makes you focus on the here and now almost at the exclusion of whatever that is because really we don't even know what that is. A lot of people grow up in that experience. Heaven is just this other than experience. And along the way... Various perspectives begin to come into play within our culture, within world cultures that try to help us understand what heaven could be like. And there's lots of different perspectives and it creates a great deal of confusion. We have these concepts that come within Christian circles at times to be out of the body is to be present with the Lord and we have these kind of ethereal experiences that are portrayed. We have language in scripture that if you don't take it in its context can almost make it seem as if heaven will be one long church service in the sky. And all we're going to do for eternity is sing songs and prostrate ourselves and say three words, holy, 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 every day, all day long, and that's eternity. And it's no surprise that there are people that begin to think, hmm, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. So all of these different things can create a great deal of confusion about what heaven will actually be like. And I am really grateful that God has opened the windows for us to quite a degree to give us perspectives in Scripture on what heaven will be like. Now there's many things that are still as yet unknown. But what we can know that's left for us in Scripture is beautiful. And so today I want to draw us back to begin that discovery again because the realities are what we most long for. So let's take a little journey through Scripture. We begin conceptually in the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, and in chapters 1 through 3, we have God creating what could only be described as paradise. It's called the Garden of Eden, and in this garden is everything that would foster human happiness and joy and pleasure. It is a beautiful environment, an environment that is not ethereal, it is not other than, it is very concrete and, and, and tangible. It is the kind of place where your feet touch the ground and your toes feel the grass coming through. It is the kind of place with real air and real water real animals, real plants, beautiful scenery. It is the kind of place that fosters human life, real, tangible, tactile human life. The kind of place where you can put your fingers through the fur of animals and feel the bark of trees and feel the leaves. It's a real 
place in every sense of the word. And yet in those first three chapters, we find that something happens in paradise is lost. God's ideal for the human race was exchanged for a lie. And paradise was lost. Now, as we come to the very bookend, the other end of the Bible, the book of Revelation at the very end, the final two chapters in the book of Revelation reveal a paradise regained or a paradise restored. And so we go from borrowing a line from Milton that paradise was lost to coming to paradise restored or paradise regained. It's forward-looking, and it is the promise that God is going to restore what was lost, finally and fully. And the question is, what will that be like? What is it that God is going to restore? And what can we gather from this? Now, in between Genesis and Revelation is lived experience of human life outside of paradise and what it's like to live in this experience. And one of those things is a longing for life to be what it was created to be. You feel within yourself at various moments in time a longing for something more. A longing for something that you can't even always put your finger on but a longing for something more. People feel this inside of themselves. For many of us, we know exactly what that more is. The thing that we read in the book of Ecclesiastes, and Solomon wrote this down, he's giving us a window into where these longings come from. These longings that are not just, I wish I had a little bit more cereal in my bowl but the longings that are deep inside of us. Listen to this in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. Solomon writes down that he, God, has also set what in the human heart? Eternity. Solomon is trying to tell us that the things that are inside of us, the longings that we have for something more, are coming from God himself. He has not left us completely adrift. He has left within within us remnants of what we were intended to experience, where we came from. And so we have these moments in our journeys, and I have had many of them in the, the period of time that I have been alive, where I wished that that moment would not end. Do you remember these moments in your experience? Those moments when maybe it was a piece of music and you found yourself just completely enraptured in that, that caught you up above everything else that was going on around you. And you felt something significant and deep and you didn't want that experience to end. Maybe it was a sunset that you saw and it was everything that was surrounding that moment in time and you found yourself longing for something even more than the sunset. You were longing for something that the sunset was just pointing you towards. I have been in places in this world where the beauty of nature was so profound that I didn't want to leave it. And and something that many of us can identify with, it is the day when you return from vacation. Do you remember what that's like? Some of you said, yeah, I just got back from one and I'm already ready to go back. It's that feeling while you're on vacation that you don't want this moment to end. You don't want this experience to end because what you are experiencing in those moments is joy. It is freedom, it is peace, 
It is something that is filling you up inside and you know that when that's over, you have to go back to hundreds if not over a thousand emails in your inbox and all of those voice messages and all of those things that have been stacking up and Monday morning will come and it will all confront you at once and it will try to suck all of that joy and experience right out, excuse me, right out of you. We don't want these moments to end. Why? Because that's what we were designed for. There is a life that we were meant to experience. And the here and now only gives us glimmers of it. But the thing that all of those moments have is that they are real experiences. Experiences that while they are impacting us deeply, come from living in a real world. C.S. Lewis put it this way in a book called Mere Christianity. It's a book that I very much enjoy. He said, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. These moments that we don't want to end in and of themselves, they're pointing us to something. They're pointing us to something that we were created for, that we have lost. They're not enough in and of themselves. They always dissipate. And Lewis is trying to remind us that the reason for that is because we were made for something more. We were made for another world. And I have news for us to remind us today it's coming. Revelation chapter 21, verse 5, the scripture that was read for us this morning. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making how much? Everything new. Now, there's, there's different ways of taking new. But here's the thing about new. I don't care how old your car is. My car is well over 20 years old, and it just continues to run, and so run it will. And I'm very happy about that. But if I was to get a new car tomorrow, it would still be a car. It would not be something other than a car. It would be a new car maybe, but it would still have tires and wheels and a steering wheel, hopefully an air conditioner because we live in California and it's summertime. It would have windows. It would have all of the things just new. The point of this is that God is not telling us that he's going to make things new in a way that we can't even conceptualize that it's going to be so completely different that there's not even a grain left of what we know. But rather, the remaking of what we have. The beauty that surrounds us only new. The experiences that are ones that lift us up to him, in, even in this fallen world, just made new. This is not something other than. It's just how it was meant to be. And God peels back the curtain for just a moment to remind us, I'm not going to put a band-aid on this. I'm not just going to make things a little bit better. I'm not just going to satisfy a couple of the deepest longings within you. I'm going to make everything how it was meant to be. And he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. When we come to the Gospels, one of the things we find is that Jesus is preaching a message that is all about the kingdom of God. 
This is his message. And then the work that he does is pointing us to what the kingdom of God will ultimately be like. Let me give you an example. When Jesus is healing people that were blind, what does he ultimately give them back? Their sight, just like everybody else has. He doesn't give them something completely different. He doesn't give them some ethereal understanding. He gives them eyes back because that's what they need. When Jesus heals a person who has a withered hand, he doesn't give them three more. He just heals the one that's not working. Everything that Jesus is doing is pointing forward to what the kingdom of God will ultimately be like, a place of wholeness, a very real place where people have real bodies and where they are whole. That's what Jesus is pointing us towards through the work that he does while he is on this earth. The kingdom of God will be a real place. And we will be real people. Now listen to this from Daniel. This is a couple of things surrounding this idea of a kingdom. We we looked at this text a few weeks back. And then we'll jump over to Daniel chapter 7 and see this develop a little bit more. Daniel is telling the king of Babylon these words. This is in relation to his dream, but this is what he says. He says, the God of heaven, at the end of all of these kingdoms that have come and gone, says the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. Not some place where we just float around on clouds. He will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. A very real experience, a real place with real experiences. Daniel chapter 7 verse 14, he goes into a little more detail. All nations and peoples of every language worship him. His dominion, speaking of God, is an everlasting dominion. That means that ultimately God will be in charge And that means that peace and security will exist forever within the universe because God is in charge. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. A real place, a real kingdom with real people and real physical places within it, concrete, it will never be destroyed. Verse 18, but the holy people of the Most High, what will they get to do? Float around on clouds playing harps. The people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it. That means they will gain entrance into it. They will have a right to be there. They will get to live within this place. How long? Forever. Yes, he says, forever and ever. Everything in the language is referring us to a real kingdom, a real physical place with real physical experiences. Verse 22, the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment, how? In favor of the holy people of the Most High. And you thought judgment was a bad thing. Daniel reminds us, judgment is actually, if you are one of the people who have placed your faith in Jesus, judgment is the best news. God is for you, and he votes in your favor because of Jesus. Pronounces judgment in favor of the holy people of the Most High, and then the time came when they, the holy people of the Most High, did what? 
possess the kingdom. Everything is moving us towards this reality in this moment when we will experience life as it was meant to be. This is everything that God has been working towards since Adam and Eve walked out of the garden. He has been working towards the day when he can open the doors and say, come on in, it's time to come home. Everything's ready for you. I have restored what was lost. And everything that you have ever desired in the deepest places within you will fully be satisfied here. What was lost is restored. Not something strange and other than. Not something that we can't even conceptualize. But what was lost, paradise itself, restored forever. Isaiah chapter 65 or 17, uh, Isaiah being the gospel of the Old Testament, one chapter away from the end of the book of Isaiah, we read these words. God says this, see, I will create what? New heavens. Not completely other than new heavens. And a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. Is God saying that you won't remember that there were such things as rocks and trees? Is God saying you won't remember that there were things such as streams because I'm doing something so different that you won't even remember that stuff and it's all going to be completely other than? No. God is saying, I'm just making it new. I'm bringing it back to what it should have been, what it used to be. I am going to create new because everything that's here has been marred by sin. In spite of the beauty that yet remains, the stuff that's not going to be remembered anymore, it's not the rocks, it's not the trees. It's the things that are broken. It's the pain associated with this life right now. Because everything that we will get to experience and everything that will come into our vision or that we will tactily experience will be pointing us towards wholeness and life. There won't be the effects of the curse anymore. We won't remember it. We won't have to. Verse 21, he goes on to describe this. He says, they will build houses, not ethereal dwellings. They're going to build houses, places to actually live in. And what will they do? Dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Verse 22, no longer will they build houses and others live in them or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. This was a language that people in Isaiah's day understood all too well because they were used to this cycle. They would build a house and a warring nation would come in and drive them out of it and somebody else would get to live in it and they would be kicked out. They would plant vineyards and at some point along the way somebody else would come and get to eat the fruit because they were kicked out of their place. And Isaiah is saying when God restores things to the way that they were meant to be, as he restores things to how they were at creation, no longer will it be that somebody else is going to come and take your home. You will get to live there for eternity. No longer is somebody else going to come and steal your grapes. 
You're going to get to enjoy them with your family and with your neighbors, and nobody's going to drive you out. The cycle is broken. That's the coming kingdom. So, creation of Adam and Eve, back to the book of Genesis. As God creates Adam and Eve, what does he create? Skin, flesh, blood, bones. As we mentioned earlier, the ability to feel the ground under your feet, the ability to feel the wind on your cheeks, to hear the sound of the leaves rustling in the trees, the water cascading down through the stream, the sound of the animals talking to each other as they do, the ability to feel and be felt. Real bodies inhabit a real kingdom. We come to Jesus' resurrected body. After his resurrection, Jesus appears to various people. And in the Gospels, we have evidence of what his body was actually like. It was not some phantom. Listen, listen to these reflections of Jesus' Uh, post-resurrection experiences with people. Thomas says, I'm not going to believe until I can see and feel. And Jesus shows up and he says, okay, Thomas, come. Put your fingers into my hands and feel the wounds. Come and place your your hand in my side and feel the wound here. Thomas, I'm a real person with a real body. Jesus eats with his disciples. They can touch him. Now, the beautiful thing is that walls don't have to bind Jesus in anymore. But he very much has a real body. And I think all of this is pointing us towards what awaits us. Real bodies, real experiences in a real kingdom. It's a real kingdom in every way. More real than we can ever imagine. And I am so thankful for that. All right, so here's here's the challenge for us. Within cultures, the confusion that persists about heaven, what it can do is it can create within us this sense of completely other than to the point where we don't feel that we understand it well enough, or we are concerned about what it could actually be like. And so what we do is we try to make heaven right here. And we do this in all kinds of ways, trying to satisfy the deepest longings inside of ourselves, and sometimes we get off course in that effort. And we find that we are not led into life, that the effect of trying to make heaven in the here and now often backfires. And so it creates this idea that there are alternatives, alternatives being let's just create it in the here and now. Let's trade whatever that could be that we don't even understand for the here and now. It's a trade It is fraught with danger and problem, and it never ultimately satisfies. So in the Scripture, God is seeking to remind us that there is a real kingdom that's coming. There is a place that we will get to inherit where things will be as they were meant to be, and we will be what we were meant to be. And the things that we have ultimately longed for, that even the most amazing experiences in this world have come shy of fully satisfying, they will be satisfied there.
Lewis writes this down on page 136 of this book, Mere Christianity. It's a question that I think our culture would do well to reconsider. But supposing that infinite happiness really is there, waiting for us. What if it is that everything that we have most longed for will be realized in that moment for eternity? Would I trade this for that? Would I trade that for this? He goes on as we come to conclusion. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, even though they might point me in the right direction, if none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. If that is so, I must take care on the one hand never to despise or be unthankful for these earthly blessings. And on the other, never to mistake them for the something else of which they are only a kind of copy or echo or mirage. I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country. I must never let it get snowed under or turned aside. Maybe like me, you have felt over the years that there are moments when it, it gets snowed under, maybe a little bit turned aside. These moments like today are the moments to draw us back into center. He, he concludes by saying, I must make it the main object of life to press on to that other country. And what else? to help others do the same. There's a song that I remember. It's in our hymnals. I am bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? Why? Because I am bound for the promised land. It's the author's way of saying my eye is fixed on that point ahead of me. And I think that as we continue to fix our eyes on what awaits us, that we will find it possible to hold on and not let that desire get turned aside. So here's, here's my entreaty to you today. Press on. Press on. Don't trade it. Press on. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the seeds that you have scattered throughout Scripture point us forward to everything that awaits us where life will be as you intended it to be where peace and joy will exist in measures that we can hardly fathom where pain and sorrow will completely cease to exist and where we will live with real bodies in a real kingdom with real experiences of community and meaning and purpose. Father, we recognize that at times our attention has been diverted. Our imaginations starved. And today as we have opened up your word, you've breathed life back into those imaginations again. And our plea today is that you would continue to inspire us with what awaits us. 
that we would press on in your strength and not lose sight of it. Thank you that you are completely able to bring us safely to that day. For we ask it in the name of our Savior Jesus, who died that we might inherit the kingdom that you are preparing for us. Amen.